Good afternoon. The National Assembly for Wales is now in session. And before we go to the first item, uh, it gives me pleasure to announce that in accordance with Standing Order 26.75, the Planning Wales Bill was given royal assent on July the 6th. We now move to the agenda and first item this afternoon, questions of the First Minister. And question one is Paul Davis. Uh, Josh Lewis. I would like to pray when you dug that Ganyad and Westshire that Pariet Bandi Yang Mount Kamini de Gledig. When we saw that Kamini Wedi and Rui Mohi did that Pari Bandi Yang Mount Kamini de Gledig, Rui Parhai I Gavloi Nor Raglen Kavlami Kamri. He did the word Mish Mehevin, but Raglen Wedi that Pari Kasastet Kavlim Yang I Bron Haner Million Oga Trevi A Business Led Led Kamri. Well, pre when you talk about and Dali vote and problem, Irai over Tholwiri. I do it. There been cohabiteth and the way that gun ruins in the bill. Men are dal glad digs. They were got foot gurthod guaitho her with boat. Kavlam der banding and amri wiorung dim point dim in megabyte a dim point pimp megabyte. So those course and Kyle effaith five of nine doi are business for a Tholwiri. Do ensure that the king can see no of it, but kavlam der. Bande Yang fel hyn yn yr Unfed Gan River Higgin yn syml yn annerbyniol, ac felly gallwch chi ddweud wrth o fi pa gymorth digidol penodol uh, sydd ar gael i bobl sy'n byw mewn ardaloedd uh, fel hyn, a pa gyngor i chi'n gallu rhoi un eithol o rhi? Bob, bydd y farchnau'n arddwrs byth yn gallu rhoi um, y gwasanaeth hyn i lawer o uh, gymuned y gwledig, da pa mwyth gwrs ni wedi'i wedi, uh, ymrwymo. Uh, I sicrhau bod nawr i chwech y cant uh, o uh, bobl a, a adeiladau dros Gymru'n Gyfan Gwbl yn gallu cael y mynediad i fan deiang erbyn mis medi y flwyddyn nesaf. Bethan Jenkins. Uh, Prif yn i dog, roedd gan y BBC cyfrifoldeb uh, fan deiang gwledig yn sretliad ffyr drwydded yn y 2010 uh, yng nghyd a cyfrifoldeb dros S4. Nawr rydym yn deall bod llywodraeth prydain wedi caniatau i'r BBC lleihau um, yr arian i ban deiang i ddim erbyn i genigen, gan arbed y gorfforaeth i 150 miliwn o bennoedd. O ystyried bod yr ysgrifennydd uh, diwylliant y Deirdre Synedig wedi dweud wrth ynghyd dweithwyr syneddol y byddai'n rhesymol i S4 ysgwyddo yr un fath o doriadau a BBC. A fyddech chi heddiw yn um, cysylltu gyda'r uh, uh, llywodraeth uh, San Stephen i ddweud nad yw hyn yn ddyrbyn ac a fyddech chi yn ymgyrchu yn erbyn mwy o doriadau i S4 sydd wedi gweld dros y pum mlynedd diwetha mwy o doriadau nad sydd angen rheidiol. Mae fe'n anelbyniol a mae'n elithyr yn cael ei ddrafftio uh, trawwyn siarad, bydd yn cael ei ala i uh, arweinwyr y pleidiau uh, y prynhaw yma er mwyn cael cyfarfod dros pleidiol uh, er mwyn delio gyda'r mater hyn, a mae hwn yn bwysig dros ben uh, ynglyn a dyfodol darlledu yn yr iaith Gymraeg. Alan Roberts. Diolch llywydd. Um, Prif wneud o gnid ar dal y gwledig yn unig sy'n dioddi o broblemau ban deiang, dych chi'n ymwybodol dwi'n siŵr o broblemau ar parth menter glanau dyfdwy a hefyd a stadi wedi anol Wrexham, a man a raglun gan y llywodraeth, um, raglun mewn lenwi uh, cam un sydd yn cael ei dendro ar hyn o bryd yn delio fod 46,000 o safleoedd, ond mi fydd na llawer iawn mwy ar ôl hynny Felly y dyn fwriad gynnych chi i gael cam dau o'r rhaglen yna ac erbyn pryd fydd y busnes yma ar uh, stadau diwydiannol sydd ar ôl, gallu deud bod nhw'n derbyn gwasanaeth uh, derbyniol. Roedd sy'n erbyn mis medi y flwyddyn nesaf bydd nawr i'ch chwech y cant o adeiladau yn gallu cael mynediad i'r band eang. Angen ar hynna sydd ar ôl, uh, bydd rhaid wrth gwrs i, I uh, ystyried ffyrdd eraill o ddatrys i uh, problemau nhw, uh, ond mae hwn yn rhywbeth wrth sydd yn uh, dod i ni o flan uh, gweddill uh, y gymuned uh, Ewropeaidd yn ymddangos uh, ymrwymiad Llywodraeth Cymru er mwyn sicrhau bod uh, bo yn cael uh, mynediad uh, i fand eang cyflym. Question 2 is Simon Thomas. <coughs> Pa'r dofydaethau mae'r rhy wynidog wedi cael gyda Llywodraeth y Dainas Gyfunol ynghylch diddymu cymorthaliadau ar gyfer datblygiadau yn ei gwynt ar y tîr. O ma gwneud o gen wedi bod yn hollol clir gyda ysgrifennydd uh, gwladol dros ynni bod ni'n erfyn wrth gwrs uh, bydd na uh, siarad o lia rhwng uh, y Llywodraeth y Dyns yn edrych a hefyd y Llywodraethau datganoledig uh, ynglyn a phendyfyniadau sydd yn effeithio uh, ni i gyd ym Mhrydan Fawr. Wel, diolch chi fyn i dog, mae datblygiadau yn ei gwynt ar y mynyddoedd yn fyfanbath i yn cyflogi pobl wrth godi y dyblygiad yna, anwaith prentisiaethau i bobl er enghraifft dan llanidloes, 
ac yn rhoi swyddi yn y cadwyn swyddi a gyfer cynnylachadwy uh, a datblygiadau hyn. Na wi ar ddeall bod y Llywodraeth yn San Stefan am dynnu y ROCs, fe mae'n cael ei alw yn ôl, a gyfer datblygiadau gwynt ar, ar y tir, uh, erbyn y flwyddyn nesa y drwy'r y gwir, a hynny yw gyda nemo trafodaeth am o'n i gyda chi fel Llywodraeth ac yn sicr dim trafodaeth yn y Senedd hon fel Senedd Cymru Chwaith. A di hwn yn sefyllfa chi'n canfod yn ddybyniol ac ydych chi'n gweld hwn yn erged economaidd i Gemglad Cymru. Ddim yn ddyrfynio, wrth gwrs i ni wastraf fel Llywodraeth wedi uh, dadle y dile Cymru rheoli uh, y rocs fel mae'n alban a gogledd uh, i werddon. Nid felly mai ar hyn o bryd, mae'n mynd i gael erged ar swyddi, erged ar economi Cymru. A hefyd wrth gwrs erged ynglyn â ymhaffordd oedd yn ni'n cael eu greu yn y pen draw. Uh, os oes y dim yn ni gwynt, yn ni gweud hynny, dim yn ni yn dod o'r hael felly byth sy'n rôl. Uh, Rhagor o ffracio, felly, uh, sydd ar yr agenda uh, gan y Lywodraeth y Dyn Senedig. Janet Howard. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. No, I'm not Presiding Officer. Sorry. <laughs> uh, First Minister, I know that you, like me, are a keen supporter of devolution. Therefore, can you explain the rationale of the Welsh Government potentially bringing decisions in-house for wind farm developments between 25 and 50 megawatts, as suggested in the consultation on developments of national significance? In addition, will you provide an assurance that local authorities will continue to have a say in matters which have such an impact on so many people across Wales? Well, uh, if the member speaks to people in power, she will know that the people, neither they or nor the local authority nor the Welsh Government have any control over the Midwest Conjoint Inquiry. Uh, it's de being determined entirely by, uh, by the UK Government using English planning guidance, uh, which is the bizarre scenario that we uh, find ourselves in. Uh, we take the view that where there are developments of national significance, they should be uh, dealt with. Uh, by Welsh Government. Uh, we believe, of course, that local planning authorities have a very strong role in the planning uh, system, something that is being denied to them in England. William Powell. George Lowith. First Minister, given the uh, turbulence that's been unleashed by the announcement on rocks, uh, what can the Welsh Government do ahead of the enactment of the Planning Wales Bill to ensure that uh, live applications currently in the system uh, in local planning authorities across Wales are given urgent attention to give them every prospect of uh, being uh, consented, if appropriate, so as to take advantage of the new uh, timetable? Well, the UK Government has said there will be a grace period uh, for applications uh, that on the 18th of June already had planning consent, already had a grid connection and indeed had land rights. We understand there are no plans uh, to say that unless uh, the uh, wind farms are up and running and commissioned by a certain date, then they will be prevented as well. Now, we know in powers that there are many communities who actually want to have uh, wind uh, power and wind turbines. Some don't. We know that. That choice is now being denied them. Uh, we know there are communities in powers like Carnot who have benefited uh, from uh, their ability to access funds uh, from wind farm developments. They will no longer be able to do so as a result of the UK government's decision. We now have moved to questions of the party leaders. And first, this afternoon, leader of the Welsh Lib Lib Liberal Democrats, sorry, <laughs> Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the Social Services and Wellbeing Act swept away nearly every existing law relating to community care, but it did not set out the standards of care that sick, el elderly and disabled people could expect. Now that you have set out those standards and the regulations to be voted on next week, it's clear that vulnerable people will only be eligible for support if their needs can and can only be met by the local council. Isn't this a green light for local authorities to, do, to reduce social services support? No, I don't believe that's right. Uh, it shows the uh, duty that we place on local authorities to provide the kind of care that people would want, uh, and local authorities uh, are aware of the challenge that uh, they face, and I'm sure they'll meet it. First Minister, right now, mm -hmm. as we speak, some local councils are already reassessing people's care needs with a view to reducing support and their excuse is that what they're doing is in line with the government's changes. Now, I'm sure that your government would not want to trigger such a massive shift without having carefully thought through 
the impact on individuals. So let me ask you, how many people do you estimate will lose their support as a result of these changes? And how many people will no longer be eligible for support once these regulations are passed that would have been eligible for support under the current system? We do not anticipate that anybody will be in that position. Local authorities must, of course, uh, provide the level of care that people would expect. It has been the case for many, many years, of course, that local authorities uh, will make an assessment uh, every year uh, in order to understand what level of care that they would be expected to provide. If you look at case law, for example, uh, local authorities uh, have to uh, have had in the past to outline uh, who they would support, what criteria would be uh, applied, and then if people fit into those criteria, then support and help must be given. What they cannot do is to deny help and support to people once those, once those criteria have been established. Well, I'm well aware, First Minister, how this system works now and how it will work in the future. The crucial element is, of course, as you've just said, if they fit the criteria. And I'm asking you, because I'm sure your government will have wanted to, to do this work, how many people do you anticipate will no longer fit eligibility criteria as a result of those regulations? And do you anticipate a drop in numbers that will be eligible for support under the new system as opposed to the old system? The reality is, if those regulations are passed next week, your government will offload responsibility for care to the voluntary sector, unpaid carers, friends and relatives who are already struggling, already struggling, if they're a voluntary sector to maintain their funding and if they're carers to do what they want to do for their relatives. First Minister, I'm glad that you've said that no one who is currently eligible will lose their support. That actually is very welcome and I'm sure you'll want to hold local authorities to that next year. But First Minister, really, are you satisfied that your government is allowing local authorities to offload support in this way? No, there's no evidence at all uh, to support what the leader of the Liberal Democrats has said. The objective of the bill and subsequent regulations and guidance uh, is to ensure that uh, local authorities are able to provide the service that people would expect uh, and to ensure, of course, that the, uh, the method by which they provide that service, the criteria they use to provide that service, uh, is more transparent. The objective of the Act is to make sure that people are able to uh, get a better level of support than before. That much is true. There is no evidence to suggest uh, that somehow care is being offloaded to others that would lead to uh, a detriment to members of the public. We now move to Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Archie Davis. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, last week, uh, week in, week out, did a programme on care in North Wales. And in particular, they raised concerns about the Gwanwin Ward uh, in the Hadvan unit in Wrexham Milo Hospital. Uh, and there were 47 allegations. And I use the word allegations because, in fairness, they are unproven. Uh, but your Deputy Minister, Vaughan Gethin, was asked, did he believe that the ward was safe uh, in Wrexham Milo Hospital? And he did not answer that question. Uh, can you confirm that that ward is safe? And more importantly, is it your view that it has been safe in the past, given that these 47 allegations uh, have been made? Yes, we have spot checks in place now uh, that uh, examine uh, facilities such as these. Uh, they have uh, not identified serious concerns in any facility across Wales. Uh, and one thing that has to be said is there have been no allegations, no allegations of any assaults by staff on patients. Uh, the BBC we did not make that clear last week. I make it clear now that was, that has never been the case. Minister. I, I did ask for a straight yes or no, because it was a simple yes or no. Is there safety on that ward? Because I think that's important for people to understand. And obviously the Deputy Minister was offered that opportunity in the programme and chose not to. That programme, along with many reports that have come forward, such as the Trusted to Care report in the Princess of Wales Hospital by Professor Julie, June Andrews, uh, the report that came out last week in the independent inquiry into Cardiff and Vale into A&E services, the survey by the BMA, the targeted intervention at Betsy Cadwallad well undertaken by Anne Lloyd. Uh, this gives a, a general direction of travel of report after report, showing that there have been serious faults in many aspects of delivery of the NHS in Wales. Two years ago, I asked you whether your government would commission a Kehoe-style inquiry. You have said to me the reason why you would not 
commission such a Keogh style inquiry is because it would cost too much. Yet all these reports and all the reservations over the last two years clearly show that a Keogh style report would have got in under the skin of many of these issues, given you, the government, the recommendations to deal with, and people could have had confidence restored. Will you now, in light of all these reports and the reservations that are out there, commission a Keogh style report in Wales? Well, the very fact that there have been these reports and action taken as a result of them shows that the system is working. Yes, there have been problems in the Welsh NHS. I mean, nobody is going to deny that. We all saw what happened at Tower Van. Uh, my own uh, hospital, the Princess of Wales, has had uh, difficult issues it's had to deal with and action was taken. Uh, the Trusted to Care report has shown that. Professor, it's, it's June Andrews, not Julie Andrews, as he put it. Professor June Andrews uh, has uh, followed up on the work that she has done and that work still continues. And the fact is we have a robust reporting system. We have spot checks uh, in place uh, and those spot checks have revealed uh, no uh, pro serious problems with the delivery of the Welsh NHS. A, an inquiry as he, uh, that he has described, a public inquiry that he's called for, would involve lawyers, would cost millions, best spend that, that money on patients and not lawyers. First Minister, you could try and divert attention by trying to take the mick out of what I've said to you today. I did say June Andrews. Everyone understands exactly the point I was making, and everyone understands that you are acting as the roadblock to actually yeah. getting an overall impression of exactly where the NHS is, led by a clinician that could deal with many, many of these serious allegations. And time and time again, we deal in, 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 a, in, a, in a, like a pocket battle type situation with postcode reports done in various parts of Wales rather than looking across the whole of Wales to see how we can look at best practice and there is much good practice in the Welsh NHS but sadly these reports identify many areas that need dramatic improvement. I also call for a duty of candor to be brought forward some two years ago. That is in the green paper. You could bring that forward now if you so chose as a government rather than have it in a green paper that will not see the light of day this side of the Assembly election. Why, why, First Minister, do you constantly stop making these uh, improvements in the Welsh NHS that could give confidence to people, whether they're patients or clinicians working in our NHS? We need a Keogh-style inquiry. We need a duty of candour. I've asked for two years for that. Why won't you grant it? Uh, there is no need for a Keogh-style inquiry. We already have the reports that have been mentioned. They have done their job. Uh, they have dealt with situations as they have arisen and spot checks have been put in place to ensure they don't arise in the future. But I have to say to the Leader of the Opposition, he, he stands here and asks questions about health. We've just had an in-year cut of £50 million pounds to our budget. Let me tell him what that would have bought. 62 community hospital wards, 50 medical wards uh, in terms of 50 people on those wards, 327 consultants, 500 doctors, 1,100 nurses, 12,000 orthopaedic operations and it would pay for 75% of the cost of our district nurses. I am not going to take lectures from him on health when he says absolutely nothing when our own budget is cut. If he'd have stood up against his own party leader in London and said 50 million cut to the Welsh uh, public service budget is unacceptable, I'd have more respect for him. But now he stands there, complains, but will not stand up for Wales. On your watch, these reports. We finally move to the leader of the Ply Cymru, Leanne Wood. <coughs> Prif fyny ni dog, mae Llywodraeth San Stefan wedi datgan y bydd disgwyl i S4 Ec wneud toriadau sylweddol. Beth yw safbwynt Llywodraeth Cymru ar ddyfodol S4 Ec? Anel Bynion, wrth gwrs, wedi si yn yr ateb yn gynarach a, a mae'n alithydd yn dod i uh, arweinwyr y, y pleidiau er mwyn wrth gwrs i drafod y pwnc yn draws pleidio. Diolch. Um, fel y gwyddodd, uh, mae rhan fwyaf o arian S4 Ec uh, yn dod o ffi trwydd, trwydded. Mae hefyd rhan o arian S4 Ec yn dod o lywodraeth San Stefan. Mae'n debyg bydd yr arian yn cael eu torri. Pa asesiad ydych chi wedi gwneud o angen arianol S4 Ec? Well, mae ma rai uh, adroddiadau yn, yn gweud y dyle S4 Ec colli uh, 30 million o bunnoedd, byddwn nhw'n uh, toriad mawr. Ond y problem yw, hwn, wrth gwrs, mae'r system trwyddedu yn, yn, yn sigledig dros ben. Os mae'r BBC yn credu bod yna ffordd i estyn y system trwyddedu i bod sy'n defnyddio, neu sy, sy'n gwylio y BBC ar yr iPlayer. Yng Nghymru, ymha ffordd mwyna'n gael ei blismona, ymha ffordd mwyna'n gallu gael ei fonitro. 
Uh, na, beth ni gwelwyn ni'n yw, um, cais gan Lwodraeth y Dynas Unedig i rhoi uh, cost ar ben y BBC i rhywbeth maen nhw mwyn neud fel Llywodraeth a bydd esperwylec yn talu o achos hynny. Felly, wi'n uh, barod wrth gwrs fe wyth sy'n gynnar â chi wyth o'n dros bleidio gyda'r pleidio eraill er mwyn sicrhau bod dyfodol esperwylec yn cael eu sicrhau. Mr. Minister, I welcome your cross-party uh, approach to this, and I'm sure that you would agree with me that S4C is much more than a, a TV channel. It's a catalyst for creativity with significant cultural and economic benefits for the country too. In light of uh, further cuts, S4C now faces a fight for survival. What has also come to light is the shoddy way in which the UK government has decided upon the future of the, the BBC without proper scrutiny, without consultation and without transparency. Are you now then of the view that this assembly should now take greater responsibility for broadcasting to secure and prioritise not just S4C, but public broadcasting in general? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic with the idea of looking at how we can have a greater say in broadcasting, that much is true. For example, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't have equivalent powers to the Scottish Government when it comes to the BBC Charter. Uh, in terms of funding S4C, it's a substantial amount of money. Uh, the, the UK government take the view that um, broadcasting isn't devolved, therefore they have a responsibility to fund all broadcasting properly. I, I can't quite understand the BBC's thinking in taking on board a £650 million burden for someone else's policy uh, and in some way you extending the uh, licence system to pay for it. We all know that the licence system is becoming more and more difficult to collect because more and more people are watching their BBC programmes on... Uh, electronic devices. Uh, how do you monitor that? How do you how do you uh, police that? It's very very difficult. The license model is becoming more and more difficult uh, to uh, see how it, how that will work in the future, and that of course then imperils the future of S4C. But this is typical. When Jeremy Hunt was the culture secretary, he had no real idea of what he wanted to do with with S4C. I met him, and it was fairly clear that they hadn't thought very very strongly about it. It's the same this time around. It's about time the Welsh language was not seen as an afterthought by the UK government. We now move back to questions on the paper. And question three is Christine Chapman. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, what consideration has the Welsh Government given to the effects on child poverty levels in Wales of welfare system changes brought in by the UK Government? Well, analysis by the Institute of Fiscal Studies on the impact of the uh, changes in Wales suggests that it is those around the poverty line, and particularly those with children uh, who are expected to see the largest income losses, and that is bound to impact negatively on child poverty. Thank you. Uh, you will be aware, First Minister, of the call by uh, the four UK Children's Commissioners, including uh, Welsh Commissioner Sally Holland, uh, for the UK Government to think again and cancel its policy of savage welfare cuts, as they rightly recognise the, the devastating impact these have had on children and young people, including here in Wales. Uh, the Commissioners say that any changes should not impact on particular groups, such as disabled children or children from single parent families or larger families, how can the Welsh Government uh, best protect uh, these vulnerable children from the worst effects of UK Government changes? Well, there are two points here. The member asked what we can we do to help people. We have Communities First, Families First, of course, and Flying uh, Start. Uh, and we know that through the evaluation report on Families uh, First that um, that has led to improvements in people's uh, situations and indeed uh, help to mitigate child poverty. But we know that the UK government will abolish child poverty because they're just going to change the definition of it. That's, that's what the, uh, the plan is. It's as, uh, it's as obvious as, as that. Last night, I was talking to somebody who works hard, who does have in-work benefits, who's going to lose them. And she said to me, why am I being targeted in this way? We used to say to people, if you get a job, then your income will improve, your financial situation will improve. That's no longer the case. What the Prime Minister has done is say, we're not going to help people who are in work by helping them with benefits. Uh, we're going to plead with employers to, to pay a living wage. And if that doesn't happen, tough luck. Yeah. Typical service. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, you should. Well, a 
Across the UK, the proportion of children living in low-income households is at its lowest level since the 1980s. But in Wales, of course, your government's responsible for tackling uh, poverty. Why do you think it is that child poverty in Wales is at highest level amongst the UK nations? And why is it falling at only half the rate in England and Scotland? It, it, it's incredible. He doesn't even attempt to defend his own party's policy. Uh, the reality is there is an attack on housing benefit, an attack on hard-working people. That's what they're doing, attacking hard-working people by removing their incomes, attacking people who've worked hard. I mean, in England now, they're going to say to people, if you have two people in a household and you earn £15,000 a year each, you know, below the average salary, we're going to penalise you with your rent. Yeah. You know, a tax on aspiration. Yeah. So it, has, it carries the, uh, the residents of people having to know their place. Well, we on this side of the chamber believe that people should have opportunity, people should have the chance to make sure that they can develop themselves to their, their best potential, and we will not tax people for their aspiration as the Tories want to do. 16 years of failure. First Minister, I think the, uh, the greatest divide between um, the, the people on these benches here and the Tories is the way we actually tackle child poverty. Um, with the Tories, it goes up even when they try to define what child poverty is. The, the figures are rising, and we've seen that now. I was therefore very surprised to hear Helen Mary Jones make a comment recently. I know she's reflected on it since, but she made a comment saying her best political moment was when Neil Kinnock lost the 1992 election to see his face then. That actually put more and more children into poverty for those remaining years that that Tory government stayed in power. And that's the reality of what we do. So, so do you agree with me that there are more children now facing the poverty and we hold our breath tomorrow, but we don't, we don't hold out any hope that this mm -hmm. present UK Tory government will actually address the issues that many of the families that we're trying to represent well, will it was face very odd. from their cuts? It was a very odd comment uh, by Helen Mary uh, Jones. I know that Plaid Cymru have claims to be a left of centre party. I don't know how it is that by celebrating the election of a right-wing government in 1992, that claim is actually supported or bolstered. Question four, Gwenda Thomas. Dear Llywydd, uh, what discussions has the Welsh Government had with the UK Government regarding the current European financial situation? Well, we regularly discuss a range of issues with the UK Government, including the current developments within the European Union. I, I think it's right to say we all hope that uh, European leaders can reach a deal that will put Greece back on the right course. It's important not just for the Eurozone, but for Britain as well. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, and and uh, as you've shown, I'm not alone in this chamber in hoping that following Sunday's referendum in Greece, a fair, just and sustainable solution to the Greek debt crisis can now be found. Unfortunately, in the interim, the situation in Greece and the continuing uncertainty surrounding the future of the euro will almost certainly take its toll on European markets. In the last financial year, the value of exports from Wales to the European Union was around 6.5 billion. Given this, First Minister, can you outline what measures the Westminster government is putting in place to assist Welsh companies that may be facing cash flow difficulties as a result of the current troubles? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, we all hope to see a solution to the crisis. I think there's a, a level of reality that's needed on both sides. Uh, I think from the Greek point of view, uh, shouting at people whose money you want is not a wise uh, uh, tactic. On the side of the ECB, I think it has to be recognised, for example, that the people of Greece work more hours. I think it's right to say that they are the second highest uh, number of hours worked in the world uh, in terms of developed countries. So they, you know, we're talking about people who work very hard and have seen their incomes hit year after year after year, and that has to be recognised. So I hope that there is a level of compromise that's reached between the uh, two sides. Uh, I can say, in terms of businesses uh, working in Greece or exporting to Greece, uh, Biz and the Treasury have issued guidance for business on temporary capital controls that are in place in Greece. Where Welsh businesses believe they may be at risk from the Greek capital controls, they should contact the business deadline for advice on cash flow uh, that's available on the gov.uk uh, website. But I can say that total exports uh, to Greece represent under 1% of total Welsh exports. Uh, so there will be some businesses, of course, who will be uh, affected. 
Uh, but in terms of the overall impact on Welsh uh, exports, that at the moment is small. But the effect on Wales and on Britain of a Greek default and a Greek exit from the euro are uh, significant. William Graham. Uh, thank you. Officer. Uh, First Minister, what advice would you give to Welsh tourists going to Greece other than to take a lot of cash with them? It appears that the systems there are about to break down even further. Although I'm sure we would all welcome a resolution of this long-standing problem, uh, you will know, First Minister, that, that Greece, unfortunately, has had a period where uh, corruption appears to be endemic, paying tax appears to be voluntary, and the economy has been mismanaged for many years. Let's hope that uh, this can be resolved quickly. Well, I, I would advise tourists to uh, look at the FCO website. It provides uh, travel guidance for all those uh, going to countries across the world. Uh, that website gives advice to people in terms of uh, carrying cash, that's true, in terms of security, but it does not say that people shouldn't go to Greece. Uh, and uh, tourism is an exceptionally important part of the Greek uh, economy. Uh, if people don't go to Greece, uh, then, of course, that will have uh, a, an even greater negative effect on the country. Roger Glyn Thomas. Prif, we're going to talk about the fact that the Sefyd Logrwydd o fewn yr Undeb Europeaidd gan gynnwys Gwlad Groeg wrth reswm ni thriadol o bwysig i fusnesau o Gymru gan bod y farchnad honno yn farchnad sydd yn cymryd lleoli prif farchnad Cymru a deyrnas unedig o ran hynny. A di chi'n cynnal trafodaethau ar hyn o bryd gyda Llywodraeth San Stefan a gyda'r Undeb Europea ddau'r mwyn sicrhau fod y farchnad honno yn cael ei diogelu i fusnesau o Gymru. Well, fi, fi, uh, fi sôn yn barod am uh, uh, ar arweiniaeth sydd ar gael, cael llawiaeth sydd ar gael i uh, fusnesau. Uh, Mi'n wir i weu bod neb yn gwybod ar hyn o byd, bydd yn gwybod sy'n digwydd dros y wythnosau nesaf. Faint o arian uh, bydd yn economi groed, ni'n gwybod tawr tia 2-3 biliwn o arian cadw sydd gyda nhw, dwi'n dwi dwi wna ddim uh, ynglyn a um, uh, ystyried economi uh, gwlad. Ond beth sy'n bwysig yw bod na gytundeb a felly bod na arian yn gallu cael ei rhoi mewn i economi groed, bod y banciau yn gallu cael uh, arian unwaith eto, a bod beth yn gallu, gallu normaleiddio yna. Question 5, Bethan Jenkins. Will the First Minister make a statement on the impl implementation of the Trusted to Care report? Yes, an extensive programme of work has been undertaken at a local and national level to address the concerns raised within the Trusted to Care report, and we will be publishing a report in the early autumn, setting out what's been done, which is leading to improved quality of care. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, but uh, recently, some of the campaigners who um, actually live in your constituents of, Bri of Bridgen received an anonymous letter uh, from some people who work at the hospital, and they're still saying that morale is very low and that they feel that nurses are being scapegoated in all of this. They say the board has appointed six new nurse directors, six medical directors, and six unit directors on salaries of up to £100,000. And those promoted to these positions include middle management in charge of the wards that, prom that prompted this particular Andrews review. Now, First Minister, this doesn't really reflect to me that things are changing as fast as they need to um, in uh, the ABMU area. So what are you doing in your leadership capacity to make sure that changes are happening and not just spot checks uh, are being administered. What more are you doing, First well, Minister? I can say that the Trusted to Care report has the support and confidence of the vast majority of my constituents, that I can say. Uh, if Professor Andrews is unhappy with anything uh, that has been done since, she is, of course, free to say so. Uh, I can say that the last and final uh, meeting uh, of the... Uh, Chief Executive and the Executive uh, Team took place on the 1st of June of 2015 and Professor Andrews is still involved because uh, this month a follow-up review is scheduled to take place. Uh, Professor Andrews will be, will be there and we await of course the outcome of that review. Uh, if the um, allegations in the anonymous letter are true then we would of course expect Professor Andrews to refer to that. David Rees. The Ochre with the First Minister last month they actually attended a briefing for all AMs in our region on the work undertaken by, AB, by ABMU in relation to the Andrews report and actually was pleased to see the progress that was being reported and the, in the recommendations of that report relating to ABMU. 
And I'm, as you said, knowing where Professor Andrews is actually returning this month. In fact, I think she's actually there this week on a follow-up work. Now, I will also await the outcome of that follow-up assessment and her views on the progress being made. However, there are four recommendations to the Welsh Government in that report. Uh, you've indicated briefly you're going to, uh, indicate you will make a, a statement or a report later in this year. But what actions have been taken on these to date? And when will we receive the update from the Minister on that report to, and the actions taken on those recommendations in specific? Well, uh, as the members already said, there will be, uh, further, uh, uh, there will be a further statement in the uh, autumn. I should add that Professor Andrews herself will be visiting both Neathbrook Talbot Hospital and the Princess of Wales this month. She will be speaking to clinical staff, to managers, to board members, as well as others. And it's entirely a matter for her to determine who she speaks to. Uh, she is not under any instruction of, of any kind. The whole point uh, of the report was to provide uh, an independent and objective uh, assessment, and that's precisely what Professor Andrews has done. Darren Miller. Presiding officer, First Minister, one of the problems identified in the Trusted Care Report and indeed the recent report into the problems at the Tower Van Unit was that complaints uh, were often being made but not properly being uh, addressed by the uh, individual health boards concerned and very often there was no learning uh, from complaints once they had been uh, upheld. What action are you taking as a government to ensure that there is learning from the complaints uh, system, and not just complaints made by uh, patients and their families, but also by members of staff who are often discouraged from making complaints for fear of retribution by managers? Well, of course, the whistleblowing uh, procedures are in place, but I can offer evidence of what's happened in terms of complaints. He, he is right. He won't hear that often from me, but he is right. Uh, to say that there was a severe problem with the dealing of complaints at the Princess of Wales Hospital. There were, I understand, some 200 complaints that were literally uh, sitting on a desk. The new complaints manager came in and visited, I understand, personally, each and every one of the people who had made complaints uh, in order to apologise to them and take those complaints uh, forward. Uh, something I very much uh, welcome. That's how people should be treated uh, when the system has not worked as they should expect. But as a result, of course, of Trusted Care, in fact, before Trusted Care was actually uh, commissioned, uh, work was uh, carried out to make sure that complaints were dealt with in a timely and thorough fashion, and that's been done with a new team that's in place at the hospital. Peter Black. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I noted that the number of complaints here in ABMU has, in fact, reduced quite significantly, and that's very welcome. And like David Rees, I was also at the briefing um, on what the implica implication, implica implementation of trusted to care in, in um, ABMU. Um, there is, though, a lot of concern about the appointment of these senior management posts, as Bethan Jenkins has outlined. Can I ask you, what, what scrutiny does the Welsh Government apply to health boards in terms of, um, of the sort of ratio of management costs to um, staff costs in this and, and are you satisfied that those that extra expenditure on management is actually justified and um, and will make a difference in terms of how the trust is run health board is run yeah there's no reason to suggest otherwise i mean the one of the issues at the princess of wales was that nobody was taking responsibility and sometimes then there is a need to appoint managers in order for there to be some, somebody with whom the buck stops, if I can put it that way. Now, uh, LHBs must make a judgment as to what the balance should be between managers and clinical staff. It's important clearly to have sufficient clinical staff uh, in place. It's also important to have the light, right level of expertise, for example, so that people can negotiate contracts, which doctors couldn't do uh, in terms of what they've been trained to do and their time. Uh, in order to provide the equipment for the clinical staff to, uh, to use. Uh, and it's for the LHB to determine how that should be done. Uh, but oh, he is right to point out that, the, I mean, I've seen it myself in terms of my uh, case, though the number of complaints has dropped substantially, uh, certainly uh, since uh, this time last summer. Question six, Lindsay Whittle. Um, First Minister, will the First Minister make a statement outlining progress uh, uh, progress made in tackling scams, please. Well, it's primarily a matter for the UK government, but we have provided funding to increase the number of no cold calling zones in Wales, which help to protect vulnerable people from scams. Uh, thank you for your answer, First Minister. Many of our older people are actually being mugged in their homes every day. Uh, what can help is, is uh, no more, uh, sorry, is more no cold call zones. That's hard to say, isn't it? Um, the guidelines regarding setting up of no cold call zones was written over a decade ago by the now defunct Office of Fair Trading. The process for setting up no cold call zones is difficult and overly complex. 
Since local government is responsible for those zones, can you tell us how can national government work closely with local government and really take a lead now in easing the processes for setting up the no cold call zones? And will you call, please, for the formal devolution of powers over this area of policy to end any more confusion? We need to decide this in Cardiff, not London, because London has failed. Well, I mean, there are two points here. First of all, uh, the member asked the question, what have we done? Well, in November 2013, we invited local authorities to bid for funding to support the creation of no-cold-caller zones. Twelve authorities responded, and uh, just under £35,000 was provided to local authorities. The difficulty is, of course, the scams that are uh, set up by telephone and online, and devolution won't help that. Uh, I would urge the UK government to ensure that the telephone preference service, for example, has more teeth. People register with it. They still get cold calls, one of them, and other people will find themselves in that situation because it's voluntary. Uh, not every organization has to, uh, I understand, register uh, under the telephone preference system, uh, and so some therefore ignore it and keep on cold calling. Uh, that has to change, and the UK government could do that. With regard, of course, to uh, online scams, more difficult. Many of them, most of them, originate abroad. And it can be very difficult then in terms of the police investigating them uh, and in terms of being able to control them from within Wales or indeed within the UK. But a start could certainly be made in terms of telephone cold calling, which is the bane of many people's lives. Mike Hedges. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. There are many different types of scam. The internet and technology have made it much easier to attempt scams. Uh, as the First Minister just said, many of them are starting off uh, abroad with countries with limited uh, laws to dealing with it. Uh, in Mor in Mo part of Morriston, uh, the Claysmont Park area, a no cold call no calling zone has been set up, which has made a huge difference in the lives of the people living there. And will the First Minister support the development of more no cold calling zones in Wales in order to stop one of the most common scams of cold calling and demanding huge sums of money for little or no work? Well, yes, the old story about your chimney is falling down, so therefore I can fix it for you for an enormous amount of money. Uh, that's, that, that was one of the, the oldest scams in the book. Uh, that, unfortunately, is still continuing. And many vulnerable elderly people particularly do uh, fall prey uh, to that kind of scam. Uh, well, I can say, first of all, that the number of homes covered by no cold calling zones uh, number about 38,000. Uh, and the minister, indeed, issued a written, written statement on the 4th of February to inform members of this uh, but, of course, uh, we will look at ways of extending no cold calling zones in the future, whilst at the same time looking to lobby the UK government to tighten up the law, particularly with telephone calls. Russell George. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I hear your answer in regards to telephone preference calling. Many of my constituents often report a frustration themselves on this matter. Uh, I've heard your answer in regards to the UK government responsibility, but uh, I'd be grateful, perhaps, if you could speak to Ofcom yourself in regards to tighter regulation. Well, it, it needs uh, tighter law. Uh, I think the system has been largely voluntary in the past, and those organisations uh, who are uh, respectable businesses have ensured that they're part of the TPS system. Uh, people now are getting cold calls from uh, organisations who are not part of that system, inevitably trying to sell something, uh, and at UK level, I think it is time, and this is, I don't make this point in terms of a party political point, I think it is time uh, to ensure that that system is tightened up and that anybody who is looking to cold call an individual uh, should be bound by whether that individual has agreed or not to be part of the TPS system. Uh, Eileen Parrott. Is, uh, First Minister, one scam that is uh, perpetrated by cold callers is the distraction burglary. And one community that's been particularly badly affected by this in my region over the last few years is the Asian community who have been targeted um, but for burglaries of uh, gold jewellery. I'm wondering if um, we can encourage local authorities to be um, broader in their description of what a vulnerable community actually is and not just assume that only people who are elderly could possibly be vulnerable, that actually a community that is being specifically targeted um, can also be considered vulnerable as well. Well, it, it, it's a matter for the police and crime commissioners, uh, I, I would argue. They have responsibility for crime prevention in their areas. 
uh, and they should be working with local authorities in order to uh, run uh, awareness weeks. I've seen it happen in Bridgeham, my own part of the world, to inform people of the, uh, the dangers. I know, for example, that David Powys uh, Police ran a week of, or ran a week of action uh, in line with the National Week of Action for Cybercrime in March of this year. Uh, they, along with Gwent and South Wales, have also introduced digital media investigation officers to increase awareness and identification of online scams. So we have examples of the police understanding uh, the challenge of dealing with crime uh, of this uh, sort. Uh, and of course, it's a matter for the police to run awareness of destruction burglary as well, uh, working with the local authorities and with the police and crime commissioners. Darren Miller. Officer. Uh, First Minister, one of the uh, issues which have been raised by uh, my constituents is that the telephone preference uh, service, the opt-out uh, within that, does not apply to government surveys and I've been alarmed at the number of individuals uh, in North Wales who are being contacted by government agencies undertaking surveys and the impact that that's having on them uh, in their homes. What, do, what action do you, take to, uh, do you intend to take to address that intrusion, particularly in respect of Welsh government surveys? Well, it's a reasonable point. I mean, I would, I would hope that government surveys of any kind are not seen as a scam uh, in, in, in that sense. Uh, but um, yeah, there are some people who don't wish to be contacted at yeah. all. We, we've all, I'm sure, in this chamber uh, stood upon a doorstep with a dilemma whether to knock the door where there is a sign saying no cold callers, please, yeah. and whether that applies to political canvassers. And, and we soon know if we knock the door uh, what the response is of that individual as to whether we should have taken notice of it or, or not. I think it's time to, to look uh, very carefully across the board. At, it's fair, public sector and private sector, uh, in terms of people being able to have a reliable service that they can opt out of and perhaps options within that opt out. In other words, are you happy to be contacted by government surveys of any description, but you don't want to be contacted by anybody selling you something? Uh, I think there's perfect scope there for to change the law in order to provide that level of flexibility. Question seven, Julie Morgan. Officer, what plans does the Welsh Government have to improve the lives of kidney patients in Wales? Well, we continue to invest in improved services for kidney patients, including increasing capacity and modernising facilities for dialysis across Wales. And of course, we're taking action to increase the number of transplants, including introducing a new system of consent for organ donation from the 1st of December. Thank you. Um, on Friday, I was very pleased to host a coffee morning in the new theatre in Cardiff, along with Jenny um, Rathbone, in support of the Welsh Kidney Patients Association. And one of the key issues they brought to us was the strain of having dialysis, and particularly if you have to have it in hospital rather than at home. So I wondered if the First Minister knew if there were any plans um, to extend um, the scheme run by Morriston um, Hospital in Swansea, in Mike Hedges constituency, which is teaching uh, patients not only to have dialysis at home, but also to have dialysis in their sleep, which is obviously much less stress um, on them in their daily lives. That's true. The renal unit at Morriston has developed a home nocturnal hemodialysis service. It is the first of its kind uh, in Wales, and it is far less stressful uh, and indeed more convenient for uh, patients. Uh, it has been piloted. Uh, it is, uh, we are now looking to roll this out nationally to make sure that more patients can take advantage of it. Question 8, Mohammed Ashkar. Presiding officer, what action is the Welsh Government taking to tackle meningitis in Wales, please? Well, meningitis and meningococcal disease is under constant surveillance to identify trends and to evaluate prevention and control measures, and evidence based immunisation programmes are in place and kept under review. Thank you for the reply, First Minister. The charity, Meningitis Now, has expressed its concern that the Welsh Government has not made a firm commitment to roll out the ACWI vaccine, which prevents 17 and 18 years olds from contracting Meningitis W. This vaccine will be available in England and Scotland from August this year. When will this ACWI vaccine will be available in Wales, please? Well, it, the, this particular strain of the virus has been much more of a problem in England, but of course uh, we cannot say, therefore, that we in Wales are in some way uh, immune to it. And uh, the members is asked the question, when will this be uh, rolled out? We're looking to do that. Uh, the next step is to agree payments per vaccination with GPs uh, in order that this service can then be um, uh, examined uh, and rolled out across Wales. Thank you, First Minister. 